The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. So hello, um, welcome everyone to the first event of the Cornell Contemporary China Initiative this spring. My name is Annika Fuhrman. I'm in the Departments of Asian Studies and Comparative Literature at Cornell. Uh, and I am hosting the initiative's lecture series under the theme of the City Asia this semester. We have a total of four talks about both contemporary and historical cities in Asia. I would like to thank the East Asia program, which houses the Cornell Contemporary China Initiative, and especially Amala Lane for organizing this series so beautifully. I would also like to thank the Departments of Asian Studies, History, and Comparative Literature, as well as the Migrations Initiative for their generous co-sponsorship. Tonight, I am very excited to welcome my colleague and friend, Denise Tang. Professor Tang comes to us from Lingnan University in Hong Kong, where she is a professor in the Department of Cultural Studies, as well as an Associate Dean in the Faculty of Arts. Professor Tang is a prolific interdisciplinary ethnographer and sociologist. Her work pioneers not only a rich interdisciplinary sociology of queer life, but it does so across urban locations in East Asia and now also in Southeast Asia. In these locations, Tang's work is committed to a focus on gender, lesbian sexualities, and trans masculinities. She sets these in relation to the study of urban space, social spaces, and cultural politics, especially in Chinese societies. The transregional focus of her research is informed by an international education and an academic and professional experience that spans Canada, the US, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. Prior to her academic career, she worked for NGOs focused on sexuality, health, and social justice in San Francisco, Seattle, and Vancouver. Upon returning to Hong Kong in the early 2000s, she also became director of the Hong Kong Lesbian and Gay Film Festival. Professor Tang's first book, Conditional Spaces, Hong Kong Lesbian Desires and Everyday Life, maps the complex relations between sexual personhood and city space, and analyzes queer female identities and desires also in the context of social justice movements and alternative communities. Tang has since worked in at least six collaborative transnational research projects and won prestigious grants in Japan, Hong Kong, and Singapore for these. Tang's most current research project is called Being Trans and Masculine, a comparative ethnography of trans men in Bangkok and Hong Kong. Today, she is presenting on research conducted in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan from 2016 to 2019. And the title of her talk is Everyday Erotics, Older Chinese Lesbians and Bisexual Women. Um, so uh, we will listen to her wonderful talk and then you have a chance in the Q&A um, to either just raise your hand or to write your question into the chat and then um, perhaps speak it out to Professor Tang. Um, so for now, please join me however you can on Zoom in welcoming Professor Tang. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I mean, I want to first thank, of course, Annika, you know, from and for inviting me to give this spring lecture for the Canal Contemporary China Initiative, and also for the wonderful introduction, you know, and also Emma Lane from the East Asia Program for coordinating this lecture. It's also wonderful to see many friends in this lecture when they start admitting all of you in. I saw some familiar faces. Um, well, not faces, but names, but especially for some of you who I haven't seen for a long time in North America. 
right? Like Huang is here. So let me share my screen now and begin. All right. So I think everyone can see it well. Great, excellent. So I actually, you know, want to begin my talk, you know, by asking, oops, let's see how I can. Great. But asking a couple of questions, you know, what leads me to feel the urge to collect Toro stories of older Chinese lesbians and bisexual women? What compels me to link global cities and connected histories by traversing local and regional boundaries in my ethnographic research? Is it because I'm growing older myself or that I find myself often in between spaces? As suggested by Chen Guanxing's statement, the more I go to Seoul, the better I understand Taipei in his book, Asia's Method Toward the Imperialization. Perhaps it is a combination of both, growing older and seeing my future selves in talking with older Chinese lesbians and bisexual women, and seeking an embodiment of oneself through interreferencing Asia, borrowing from our own work in welding cities. But let me begin with a methodological episode in Singapore, encountered by myself and Shauna Tang, my collaborator in Singapore, who is currently based at the University of Sydney. We met Joey for our research interview at the food center in the Newtown Public Housing Estate. Before we could pick Joey out from all the strangers at the Hawker Center, a stout and masculine figure approached us. Our mutual masculine expressions had rendered us mutually recognizable. Joey is a well-built, handsome, and tan 60-year-old. We looked like frail and weak younger butchers next to Joey. Want a beer? Joey asked, sizing us up. We both paused, looked at each other, making very self-conscious kind of calculations. We are lightweight drinkers, too early in the mid-afternoon. Will we be able to stay focused during the interview? Cold beer, really hot Singaporean heat, but wouldn't that be refreshing? We kept asking these questions to ourselves. Joey re repeated the question impatiently. Hurry up, beer or water? I stuttered and hurriedly chose water. Shauna also chose water. Joey returned with two bottles of distilled water for us and a mug of beer for herself. As we twisted the tiny plastic bags of our uh, caps of our bottled water, Joey took a big gulp of her beer, our beverages now marking a divide across the table. Joey's friends walked by, chatted and patted Joey on the back. Obviously, Joey rules the Hawker Center. Had we ordered beer, our embodied masculinity might have been more immediately intelligible to Joey and might have opened communication channels. Instead, we stuck to our internal standards of being a good researcher. Protocol, right? Refusing alcohol so as to stay focused during the interview. The decision we made proved to be a miscalculation. Joey was not comfortable enough to be audio recorded and we had to take field notes. Joey also spoke to us in a mix of local dialects in one sentence changing swiftly between Singlish to Hokkien to Cantonese, and also using Mandarin and a couple of Japanese terms. It was a challenge just to keep up with the flow for us. My current book project, Everyday Erotics, Ethnographies of Older Lesbians and Bisexual Women in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan, presents the life stories of older Chinese lesbians and bisexual women born in the 1940s and 50s in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan, through an interdisciplinary ethnography, combining field work and cultural analysis of inter-Asia mediations of femininities and masculinities. I took cues from the Modern Girl Around the World Research Group project. I followed the group's line of questioning in asking, how was the Modern Girl global and what made her so? and reframe my inquiries as to what makes a Chinese woman lesbian and how did it happen? 
whereas the Modern Girl Around the World Research Group um, focused on the global phenomenon of the modern girl in the 1920s and 30s, their contribution to pulling together, and I quote, multifaceted linkages, ideological, aesthetic, and material, unquote, has informed my own thinking about how Chinese women with same-sex desires in the post-war generation can be similar and different, recognizable and missed at the same time. More specifically, I try to trace a map same-sex intimacies among older Chinese women across three research sites. It took me to different places. It required me to do a lot of archival research and fieldwork interviews using both conventional and exploratory methods. The figure of the Chinese lesbian can be both real and imagined in our historical narratives and contemporary social worlds. Departing from sexual self-identification as lesbian per se, I locate the Chinese lesbian as a woman with same-sex desires who has developed significant romantic and sexual relations with another woman. Based on in-depth interviews with and participant observation of older Chinese lesbians and bisexual women in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan from 2016 to very much, you know, to the present moment from 2019 and onwards, I look at intersectional spatial, cultural, and sexual practices to elucidate the formation and circulation of the social, cultural, and political meanings of lesbian bodies and desires in an inter-Asian context. Different from the identifiable visual aesthetics of the modern girl, the Chinese lesbian operates in disguise by being simultaneously conformative in certain gender roles and expressions, and also being very rebellious and unruly in others. Whereas the modern girl, of course, was briefly noted for her sexual transgressions in same sex or interracial sexuality and in sexuality outside marriage, and I quote, by the Modern Girl Research Group. Everyday erotics, my book project, take up where the Modern Girl Project left off and extends it to look at the linkages among modernities, lesbian desires and gender in different contemporary Chinese societies. As the stories of my subjects unfolded, narratives of sexual conquests, queer friendships, work experiences and travel in the Asia region began to emerge in the making of the social worlds. So let us now dig into some of the stories that I collected and I'll share some of them with you. Let us now dig into some of the colonial spatial encounters in Hong Kong, from Singapore to Hong Kong now. The late 70s and 80s were described by 64-year-old when I interviewed her, Rachel, as, and I quote, the golden era of Hong Kong. In her own words, she said, I know I reaped the economic benefits. Those were the days when I go off um, to work in the day, play mahjong late into the night, have a late meal in the early hours, and then go back to work without sleeping, of course. Going to clubs are reserved for the weekends, unquote. Rachel worked in a textile and garment trade as a merchandiser before entering the broadcasting industry in the 80s. Inspired by feminist geographer Doreen Macy's description of her work, of her um, work and also her walk in Kilburn in the UK, I attempt to provide a walking account of Rachel's spatial encounters drawing from her narrative. Rachel's long night of going to the bars often began with meeting up in Lan Kui Fong, Lan Kui Fong. Lan Kui Fong's history can be traced back all the way to the early 19th century as a watering hole and a place for prostitutes. The area became associated with discos and expats, expatriates after the establishment of Disco Disco. Now, Disco Disco was founded by Gordon Huthard, son of an influential British businessman. And you can see some of the images here that I took um, that you can find also uh, online. There's some of the flyers, uh, old flyers from Disco Disco, you know. 
uh, back in the uh, 80s and 90s. And some of the um, celebrities actually often go to Disco Disco. You can see in the middle, um, the already the late um, Danny Chan, and then also Anita Moy on the right-hand side. We look at some of the uh, images there. And also, of course, uh, Disco Disco along with um, Canton Disco are very well, uh, as long as uh, with the flyers that you see down there with Boys Night Out, those are the places that people would go um, during uh, the 80s uh, in Hong Kong. So the disco itself was founded uh, by some of an influential British businessman, Gordon Hubbard. The nightclub was a meeting place, of course, of British imperialism, also sexual desires and colonial modernity. Cultural imperialism manifests itself in the disco's Egyptian interior design and willingly sipped by Rachel in a glass of gin and tonic. Rachel jokingly remarked, and I quote, I've never thought gin and tonic would make a comeback now, but have you seen all the new craft gin they are selling now? I even have to get decent tonic water to go with it, unquote. The founder, Gordon Huffert, daringly injected gay desires into Lan Kwai Fong nightlife, gentrifying an area of tenement walkouts into a hub of bars and clubs in an era where male homosexuality was criminalized in Hong Kong. Disco Disco later closed down, replaced by other establishments in the area, such as Club 97. The area itself became associated with Alan Zeman, a Canadian businessman who turned blocks into a conglomerate, conglomeration of bars and restaurants and replicated its model to another Chinese city, Shanghai. As cogently argued by Doreen Macy, places are processes where one develops, and I quote, a global sense of the local, a global sense of place, and unquote. Disco Disco is representative of a bygone era and a place of transition. The gay cultural institution brought a piece of British empire history into a local area where a specific sense of global meets a class infused and gender inflected local. Rachel recalled her long, long night of partying. And I quote from her, in those days, we worked hard and played hard. Weekends were relentless in terms of partying. Everybody wanted to be seen at Disco Disco. If you talk to anyone who were in the 80s gay scene, they must have been to DD or wanted to go there. Expat or Chinese, straight or gay, single or married. I went to friends to experience the atmosphere, to feel the air the excitement, to enjoy oneself thoroughly. But it was the 80s, you know, and life was good. You couldn't see when happiness would end, unquote. Rachel's spatial encounter is an interweaving of histories and sexualities through her regular practice of frequenting a bar with known gay and lesbian patronage. She stepped into a represented space of colonial modernity as a bisexual woman bathing in a moment of bliss, even as she talked about those days to me during the interviews. Yet in the recollection of the golden era, one might ask about the romanticizing of colonial times and the nostalgia of past memories. What does this act of remembering inform us of the present? Rachel's reminiscing of a better time can be interpreted as not merely a recollection of fond memories, but rather as a way of telling us the missing physical spaces of sociality in the present. Urban neoliberalism paved the way for heightened visible sexual subjectivities, but also limits the heterogeneity of queer lives. The notion of everyday erotics can be expanded beyond physical sexual relations to include social interaction of flirting and verbal expressions of foreplay. Embodied spatial practices can point to one's entry into an environment that is deemed safer and more permissive in expressions of lesbian desire. Spatial awareness of one's lesbian or bisexual body holds has an, has an effect on how same-sex desire is expressed. Sexual relations are produced and reproduced through bodily acts and specific sites of desires. Spaces, of course, are dynamics. 
even though they can be offline or online right now with you and open to many interpretations and feelings that we might have. As Doreen Macy aptly puts, spaces are also unfinished processes, allowing for a multiplicity of stories to unfold within them endlessly. I am invested in excavating the connections between places, the meanings of gender expressions, and the impact of class and culture across Chinese society steeped in Confucian ideology. In particular, when a Chinese lesbian disrupts heteronormative sexual scripts and gender codes, be they major or minor ruptures, she's bound to be scrutinized if recognized and dismissed if invisible. But the self doesn't act alone. As elaborated by Chen Guangxing, Chen, Guangting, uh, Chen Guangxing's concept of critical syncretism, the self as subjectivity is embedded within a web of social relations that involve processes of, and I quote, self-critique, self-negation, and self-discovery, all imbricated in histories of colonialism, nationalism, and Cold War politics. The life narratives of older Chinese lesbians and bisexual women in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan demonstrate how these processes materialize in term I coin as everyday erotics. It is in the everyday erotics of density, movements, and conformity that stretch over 50 years that we can understand the social construction of lesbian desires and subjectivities within an inter-Asia context. Erotics, of course, come in myriad forms and descriptions. For example, in studying India's public representations of erotic images in 1990s television programs and commodities, Pranima Mekaka, um, the second point here on the PowerPoint, describes erotics as sexualized longings and pleasures constructed at the intersection of the psychic and the structural. Reading the self-making practices among Cuban gay men, Jafari Allen pauses the erotic as a catalyst for the creation of community, thereby treating self, subjectivity, as social in relations and as capable of building collectivity. Fran Martin asserts contemporary representations of Chinese women's same-sex homoeroticism as implicit in cultivating the impossibility of lesbian futures. That's what she would call uh, that through the telling of female homoeroticism as memory, or as the apt term in uh, Fran Martin coined the term, backward formations. I attempt to pull together all these interdisciplinary scholarship on Chinese female same-sex desires and provide a new reading of Chinese lesbian subjectivities as inter-Asia in making and grounded in local neurotic practices. And I really feel that the image that you're looking at, like this door behind the door behind the door and finally seeing the Chinese lesbian, lesbian and bisexual woman figure in the back is almost like peeling, opening doors, opening doors, almost like peeling, peeling surfaces away from me. As I talk with each of them, um, with, through my interviews and my food work, the becoming of a Chinese woman with same sex desires is also is often entangled with deviations from the traditional gender roles of Chinese women. These kind of deviations, you know, these kind of disruptions pull us back in time to examine the question of what really makes a Chinese woman lesbian. Here, I do not take Chineseness or becoming lesbians as unified kind of concepts. Rather, it is the complexity of Chineseness and becoming lesbian or recognizing your lesbian desires embedded within descriptions of race, ethnicity, gender, and sexualities in different Chinese dominant societies across time that enrich our understanding of inter-Asian knowledge production. I understand the idea, the notion of becoming lesbian as a recognition of lesbian desires and the adoption of same-sex sexual practices manifested in everyday Erotics. I look and I seek 
to find older Chinese lesbians and bisexual women who are rendered invisible in the genealogies of gender and sexualities. So most of these informants who I've talked to in this study were born in or before the 1950s and grew up amid the politics of learning to become uh, a nation, the term that is used um, widely used um, to describe actually Hong Kong's uh, current status. Right? Hong Kong, given its past as a British colony, has arguably developed a hybridized kind of cultural identity. Taiwan was a Japanese colony from 1895 to 1945, and later under Guomindang, uh, Guomindang's rule, post-war Taiwanese society was characterized by remnants of Japanese modernization and also the Guomindang's nationalizing project of Chineseness. Singapore was a British colony from 1819 to 1959, finally becoming an independent state in 1965 a multi-ethnic immigrant society within a Malay environment. Singapore's cultural identity was constructed aggressively against a backdrop of economic utilitarianism and an unrelenting work ethnic ethic. Taiwanese law protects the rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people in the workplace and in schools, and with same-sex marriage legalized in Taiwan in 2019. Under British law, homosexuality constituted the crime of buggery in Hong Kong until 1990. Singapore is the only one of the research sites in which homosexuality still remains illegal on paper, at least. Yet in terms of LGBT visibility, all three sites have emerged in, on different ways as queer Asian cities with Taipei, the representative city of Taiwan. In Taiwan, I encountered Jin Mama, a Lao Ti, to use Antonia Chow's popularized term to denote older butch women in Taiwan. The story of Jin Mama is actually very well known in Taiwan, and traces of her story can be found in the brilliant work of, of um, Amy Brena on cross-generational ethnography of queer lives in Taiwan. And more recently, the publication of this book that you see on this image, Amade Lopangyao, Amade Nupangyao, um, the publication of Grandma's Girlfriends, The Splendid Youth of Elder Lesbians by Taiwan Tongzhi Hotline Association. We had our interview in Jin Mama's flat with her lesbian daughter, 59 year old Jin, after having a sumptuous meal of sashimi, fried rice noodles, clam soup, and Chinese cabbage. Jin Mama, who you see right now uh, in the illustrated um, image, wearing a men's dress shirt tucked in neatly, tucked very neatly into trousers with her left hand holding uh, onto the handrail and climbed up the steep stairway when she led us all the way up to the place, um, up to the room, the living room where we had our interview. We went inside her flat, took off the shoes, pulled up rattan armchairs, which we're all sitting around uh, in the living room and wooden stools together to form a circle in the living room. Jin offered us tea and we sat down to begin our interview. In Taiwan, I have uh, asked the assistance of Amy, whom you also see here in the image with a fan, that's uh, Amy from Tongzhi Hotline Association, to help with recruitment and also interviewing informants due to my own inability to speak the local Hokkien uh, Minan Hua, Minan language. I can only understand, of course, um, conversational uh, Mandarin myself. So um, when I was doing the interviews in Taiwan, I always also asked someone to come with me. Uh, a lot of times Amy came to help with um, the Hokkien uh, Minan Hua. So Jin Mama's story is as legendary, um, as Amy Brainer would agree with me, that having lived in, in one neighborhood north of Taipei during formative years of her youth and adulthood, Jin Mama emphasize her locale and the social networks that she formed as very important to her economic, uh, I mean, uh, to her romantic relationships. She referred to her groups of friends as the gang of 13. They had known each other since the age of 17 and remained close to each other until their early 30s, when some of them moved away, married or had children. Jin Mama herself married at 24 years old and still remained as part of the group until she left for Japan to work in her 30s. 
She didn't return until 12 years later, having left her daughter, Jin, who is also a um, uh, butch lesbian, uh, and uh, to be solely responsible for her younger sons. And actually, uh, her daughter now uh, mostly identified as trans. She described the group fondly as a group of hooligans, um, uh, Jin Mama, who worked in the day and gathered at night to fight for their turf and girlfriends. The group was characterized by their androgynous clothing and the notorious clout in the neighborhood. I asked Jin Mama about her romantic relationships and she gave snippets of a letter writing kind of practice. She said, I've always written letters like having pen pals in every place, in Kaohsiung, in Taichung. I wrote them letters usually after meeting the girl only once. So I had a girlfriend in each place. And this is uh, the quote from Jin Mama, who is 81 year old when I uh, interviewed her. In the old days, there was no telephone contact. Writing and getting letters took at least two weeks. I often wrote letters to my lovers to arrange a time to meet up at Taipei train station. So when I went to the main train, um, main train station every Sunday and waited and waited, we waited to see who would turn up from the letters I wrote. If someone showed up, we then all went out to have fun. One time, I took a new girlfriend in my neighborhood to the train station and by chance bumped into my other girlfriends. A fight broke out and I left. All this became too much very soon and I left Taiwan for work in Japan. The farther physical distance between places have encouraged the practice, of course, of writing letters. Now in her 80s, Jin Mama viewed heterosexual marriage as part and parcel of one's life. Jin Mama further elaborate. It's good for my girlfriends to be married. They are busy. I'm busy. We'll get together when we can. Jin Mama's story is full of longing and waiting in relation to her fulfillment of sexual desires, close intimacy, and long time companionship. The duty to wait goes both ways. Love was measured by extended lengths of absence. Years of waiting were expected and commonplace in her social world as letter writing is the only accessible form of communication across distances. Jin Mama performed her traditional gender role as a married woman, a wife and a mother, simultaneously had same-sex relationships while donning an ultra masculine appearance. Jin Mama can be seen as both deviant and conventional at the same time. Jin Mama grew up in the last stage of Japanese colonial administration, and she also traveled to work in Japan uh, for 12 years. The impact of those 12 years on her sexual life was minimized. Unlike travel literature on sexual experimentation and liberation of women, Jin Mama appeared to have most of her sexual life immortalized in her young adulthood in Taiwan. She never dated after she returned to Taiwan and has only kept in contact with old friends among whom some of them are her former girlfriends from the time before she left for Japan. Although she openly meets up um, and only meets up with these old friends or former girlfriends infrequently, she appears content with minimal content. Rather, she challenged my presumption of keeping relationships alive through frequent um, contact. She reminded me of the need, you know, of the need to feel the longing and the waiting. This would keep, this, was, this would actually keep romance flourishing. And in waiting is where intimacies can be properly admired. This, which is explained by her perception of appropriate courtship behavior for a Lao Ti, an older butch. Lao Ti means an older butch in Mandarin, in Taipei in the 1960s. Earlier ethnographies on butch lesbians and masculine identified women have clearly illustrated the intricate embodiments of butch masculinity, where notions of caregiving, nurturing, assertiveness, narcissism, and suffering can exist contradictorily and simultaneously within the social construction of butch identities. For Jin Mama, same-sex intimacies are only ruled as desired when a process of longing and waiting is in order. 
So I'm going to go to the last part, you know, of today's lecture by, of course, going back to Joey, our Singaporean informant in Singapore. Now, throughout the interview, Joey repeatedly proclaimed, you know, and I quote uh, from the interview, of all places, I like Hong Kong the most. So each time when Joey would say that, Joey would look at me directly in the face and would seem to be um, saying the sentence for me to hear again and again, because Joey knows, of course, that I'm from Hong Kong and my collaborator, Shauna, is local Singaporean. So Joey repeatedly say that and all often put me in a position which I, I don't really know how to react because I already felt that we made the wrong decision by, of course, having water instead of having uh, beer, right? So this act of kind of proclamation that Joey uh, did happened at unlikely moments, as if she suddenly got caught up with my social location as a Hong Konger, as if suddenly she would call Hong Kong by my name. You know. I asked her why, and she explained, and I quote, Hong Kong was new. It's a fast place with fast people, messy, but fierce, unquote. Then we will continue our interview until another moment sprang up, another proclamation made. Counting back the years, Joey worked in colonial Hong Kong during the mid 1970s. The city at that time was on the brink of burgeoning capitalism and the developing local identity that celebrated cultural hybridity. Cosmopolitanism was on the rise along with a new form of Chinese modernity that has differentiated Hong Kong culture from that of its neighbors of Taiwan and Singapore. In studying the rise of public culture in these three sites, Alan Chen argues that different compositions of racial and ethnic origins resulted in varying relations where, and I quote, nationalism, colonialism, and market capitalism interact, unquote. As the colonial administration worked to downplay the significance of Chinese nationalistic forces at play, a, depolitan, a depoliticization of public culture, Chen Guangxin would say, I mean, Alan, um, Alan Chen would say, and a denationalized cultural space allowed for the emergence of some kind of transnational intercultural logic in Hong Kong culture. Drawing upon Liu Aofan Li's Lei Aofan, Comparative analysis of pre-World War II Shanghai and post-war Hong Kong's rise of urbanity, uh, uh, Alan Chung summarizes the geopolitical location of Hong Kong aptly, and I quote, as the free market port that ushered in the modern, in the modern world system, driven primarily by utilitarian imperatives, established a depoliticized vacuum vis-a-vis -vis competing Chinese nationalisms that facilitated, if not actively promoted, the absorption of a foreign non-indigenous modernity that likewise became the basis of its cosmopolitan culture." Unquote. In describing a past Hong Kong as a place that is contradictory in its nature, new, messy, but fears, these are the words that Joey you know, described Hong Kong from Singapore, is naming modernity as if modernity is what it is, with obvious forces at play. One can interpret the messiness as an absorption of foreign cultural elements that feeds what Chun puts a depoliticized vacuum, uh, vacuum, or maybe a description of a city that is developing is indig indigeneity in relation to a form of British colonialism that is different from that in Singapore. In Joey's bringing up of Hong Kong in her lived experience as the best place to work and stay, mom and stay mom uh, momentarily, also in Joey's cultural imagination of the city's offerings in the past, and in her current repetitive asking, you know, and proclaiming Hong, you know, that, um, that of all places I like Hong Kong the most. I feel that she really is engaging in what um, Fran Martin and uh, Larissa Heinrich, uh, Eric Heinrich would say, a self-conscious shift to assessing Chinese modernities. Martin and Heinrich call us to heed attention to a plurality of Chinese modernities. 
where various versions of Chinese language-based culture not only grow out of different modern histories, they record distinct experiences of colonialism and they bear differential relations to territorial and political Chineseness and to other kind of formations of modernity, Soviet, European, Japanese or American formations of modernity. The conjuring of Hong Kong from a Singapore-based subject contains messages that at first glance appears to build affinity across the table at the Hawker Center where we met, yet on a deeper level is actually calling up comparative modernities that possess a relation to British colonialism. By actually proclaiming her distinct liking for a place both near to and far from her lived experience, Joey immediately recalls the travels she made in her early days, working in bars and nightclubs where both female co-workers and male clientele came from different yet interconnected parts of Asia. Joey used to, of course, work in these nightclubs, in bars, on different capacities and met different kind of customers of all over from Asia, right? In Hong Kong and in Japan, where she worked momentarily before her return uh, to Singapore. As Chinese modernities reflect each other in Joey's account, we are reminded of her sexual adventures as quite short-lived and as varied. She lived her life in precarity and in fluidity. Joey's masculinity is also expressed through the telling of her brazen adventures and the manner in she narrated the stories to us in public. Throughout the interview, she stressed her freedom to move and to pick up and go whenever she wants to in her entire life. She actually laughed at myself and my collaborator, Shauna, say that we are stuck to our jobs. We are always under control by someone else. We had no freedom, unlike her. Similar to Jin Mama, the Taiwanese uh, informant, their increased level of mobility were often seen, first seen as irresponsible to family members who were left behind. It can also be perceived as a characteristic of what Megan's note would say, Tom, masculinity. So I will end my lecture here today. I hope I'm able to pull you, you know, slowly into scenes from the Hawker Center in Singapore to a gay club in Hong Kong, to a train station in Taipei, across time and continents. And I look forward to interacting with uh, most of you. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you so very much, Professor Tang, for this fascinating lecture and view into one of your current research projects. Um, I would like to invite the audience to reappear on camera if you like, so you can have a real conversation. Um, and then we'll take some questions. Uh, you could either just raise your hand or you could write in the chat. Um, and I would, let's take uh, the first two questions from undergraduate students. Um, great, Aisha, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, um, thank you so much um, for this lecture. It was very informative for sure. And it was really nice to see like, um, I guess like the LGBTQ like sort of journey and experience from a, like a different country, like from a different country, a different perspective. Culture. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, so my question was sort of taking into account, like based off of your research and, and maybe like some insight, you know, taking into account maybe economic status or class, um, you know, at what sort of like intersection of those two would you say that it's easier maybe for people to sort of quote unquote stomach, if you would, I don't like that word, but quote unquote sort of find maybe more palatable the unification between like Chineseness um, and, and lesbian and being a lesbian or being a bisexual, um, if that made any sense. Hi, thank you. Hi, Aisha. Yeah, so I think um, that's a good question. Actually, what was interesting um, to me is because of the three different uh, research sites, you know, that I was doing my field work, what I found uh, in 
in Taiwan was a lot of all, also most of the informants definitely were working class. Um, in Singapore though, and in uh, Hong Kong, I actually, um, most of the informants were uh, middle class actually, with very few of them uh, being working class. So I think that tells me also something about what you're saying about the, um, the, the kind of class formations, you know, of these different um, places uh, in also in terms of what, um, how, how do I see that enables them to be able to feel comfortable maybe to talking to me, you know, as an interviewer who I've been able to get hold of to talk to me, you know, about it. That I think the class background actually makes a big difference in, in this sense. Maybe what I can make, give you a concrete example. For example, in Hong Kong, which I did all the field work uh, myself in Hong Kong without anyone um, with me, you know, I, most of the working class, let's say in terms of working class informants who were talking to me, most of them were actually um, working in the police force, you know, because, um, for them during the um, 50s and 60s, that's the way for women to um, be able to feel they can be some, um, to get a job, to feel independent, but also to alleviate poverty, you know, from the families, was to enter into really another space, which is highly, of course, masculine, hyper-masculine, right, in that sense. But that's where I see the intersections, of course, of class, and also being able to express themselves uh, through gender expression of that. Yeah. Mm. So I hope I, yeah. No, yeah. And, and sort of like just a, a little bit of a follow-up. So I guess in a way, like, do you, I don't, I don't know how to like necessarily phrase this, but like, so in terms of like, let's say like masculinity, right? Mm. And embodying masculinity and, and being a lesbian or like, is that like, mm you know how like there's sort of like the like the like the butch lesbian or like the femme lesbian or like sort of like these like but mm. like, I guess a connoted framework type of like you know um for these like identities like mm. in these areas that you studied like did you find that there was sort of like a an old maybe an overlap between maybe like trying to I don't know if this is going to come off right but like trying to sort of like maybe embody like certain quote-unquote like masculine traits in order to sort of like validate like their own like identities for example um like does that make any sense I don't know mm -hmm. mm. No, 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 I think I know what you're getting at yeah definitely I think part of it is that um of course that also shows the limitations maybe of the research also right um I've been able of course to talk to more I think butch uh, lesbians and femme lesbians, I mean, uh, um, and bisexual women. Um, I, in terms of the proportion, of course, of uh, women who are willing to talk to me, I think mm -hmm. that most of them still, um, it was easier to, I guess, to identify, I think, butch uh, lesbian this way, and they're more willing to share with me a little bit more. I do have femme um, lesbians uh, participants who are willing to uh, talk with me as well. Um, I think in the old days, maybe it was how it's being, um, is more visible, I guess, for them to feel, um, to become a, uh, a lesbian is to be able to express um, themselves different from the traditional kind of gender roles, right? Mm -hmm. To be really quite different that way. That's why I would say they are more unruly or rebellious that way. Mm -hmm. But not to say femme lesbians are not, because a lot of them are still, um, some of them who I talk to are still in heterosexual marriages but I've always had same-sex um, relations the whole time, right? Oh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, and had children, and then, of course, would have grandchildren also, right? Wow, and, okay, uh, wow. So in this sense, it's a much more complicated story that, you are, uh, that, that, you know, you, that I'm looking at, you know, mm -hmm. for that matter, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. because even for the butch, you know, lesbians that I've talked to, um, a lot of them were also married before. And then they would say that if they're divorced, that, and if they do not have children, they actually, um, a couple, uh, quite a number of them would say to me that I'm so fortunate that I didn't have children because it would be so difficult, you know, um, mm -hmm. to navigate all of that, you know. But um, of course, it's, that makes it um, very complicated, that entire, uh, the, collecting the story and analyzing the stories that way. Thank you so much. Yeah.
No, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Um, should we take one more question from an undergraduate student and then we'll open it up to just everyone. Oh, fantastic. Sabrina, please. Yes. Hi, I just wanted to thank you so much for your lecture. Um, it was incredible. And I'm quite a fan of your piece, Conditional Spaces. I've read it a few times for um, some different assignments, particularly I'm really interested in Hong Kong cinema. So I really enjoyed that piece for that reason. Um, and actually my question pertains to Hong Kong cinema as well as um, like same-sex desires. Um, I was just wondering if you thought what your perspective was on you know, films about same-sex relationships such as Let's Love Hong Kong and um, Happy Together um, and other films with just like predominant like same-sex relationships as well as um, actors who have come out into the public sphere. Um, so I was just wondering if you thought that had any impact on how um, perhaps butch lesbians specifically felt about coming out into a public space. Um, I know in your piece, Everyday Erotics, you talked about how a lot of lesbians still suppressed their same-sex desires, even in societies where, um, you know, it was becoming more acceptable to discuss um, these desires. So I was just wondering what your take on that was. Mm, 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 mm. Sure. Uh, yeah. Have, have you watched uh, Let's Love Hong Kong? Have you been able to watch Hong Yuk, Let's yes. Love Hong Kong? Yeah. yeah. So, so what did you think of that? So let me, let me ask you that question first. Um, it was it was unlike any other film that I had seen. Um, mm, mm. I thought it was very interesting, though. I really enjoyed the aspect of having three different women represent having three different women represent different like social standings and how that contributes specifically towards um, acceptance of one's same-sex desires. Um, yeah, I also really enjoyed how you could, you could sense that even though like the temporality of Hong Kong was moving so quickly, like, it almost felt like the three women were at a standstill the entire time trying to battle their identity and just understand themselves and how they fit into society. Great. Wow. I, I think um, the director, um, Yao Chen, would, would have loved to hear what you have just said. Uh, Thank you. Now. Yeah, yeah, Sabrina. Uh, actually, I think um, what um, is interesting about Hong Kong is I think from the outside, you know, if you look at the popular culture of Hong Kong, as well as Hong Kong cinema, you would think that Hong Kong society is very, very open and acceptant of LGBTQI plus um, sexualities and desires and all that. But actually, unfortunately, it's not. It's a facade, I always say, you know. Of course, celebrities have come out, which were very important, I think, in many ways, you know, to, uh, for the communities to see them with Anthony Wong and with Denise Ho and Leslie Jung also, you know, um, in Happy Together, having uh, come out earlier, as, um, of course. And with um, also openly gay film director, you know, Stanley Kwan, you know, and all that. But it it has an impact in terms of um, giving us some, uh, giving us media representations or something that we can always refer to, uh, to rely on, but it doesn't, it doesn't give us the kind of um, legal recognition that we need in Hong Kong, right? So it, it actually, it, um, from the outside, you will feel that it looks like Hong Kong is ready you know, to accept, you know, let's say same-sex marriage or even um, just um, uh, legislation on anti-discrimination against LGBTQI plus uh, folks, right? But we don't have any of that, actually. Yeah. So it's actually in comparison, if you say to Taiwan, we are really backward, you know, really, really, you know, um, not progressive uh, this way. But what makes Hong Kong fascinating, though, and, and actually... Um, is Hong Kong has to fight its way of these LGBTQI plus rights through the court system or through the corporate world, you know, which um, I've done a research on um, also lesbians and bisexual women working in the financial services industry, which one of my actually team, you know, collaborative team staff is here, <laughs> uh, who actually was able, um, we worked on a project together, you know, um, to really 
look at how lesbians and financial women are faring in the financial services industry. Now, why financial services industry? It's because Hong Kong has always been known as a world finance center, right? And, and it's supposed, I guess, it gives you the impression that Hong Kong should be very open, you know, to all these kind of global LGBTQI plus rights, right? But actually through the research, we show that it's not, we're still quite behind, even though on paper across, you know, different uh, transnational corporations or places, we will see that there are, you know, policies, HR policies helping it. But on the local level, a lot of people still are very um, shy or um, not shy is not a good word to say it, but um, actually feel that they will be discriminated if they come up you know, at work, you know, to make it very bluntly that way. I'm always still quite shocked when I um, ask students to do ex assignments, creative assignments of making, you know, videos, making short films, and they would interview their friends or they um, who turn their backs, you know, and talk about their coming out stories. So I, and I always felt that it's so, um, that, I always felt sad when I see those stories, actually, because I felt that, of course, I thought we were at a different place, you know, in, in some ways, you know, but you still, it's still quite common uh, here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Fantastic. So, so we have many questions and the next person in line is Song, please. Yeah, hi, thank you so much for this fascinating talk. Uh, I have two questions. I'm particularly interested in Joy's experience uh, when you mentioned that she went to Hong Kong and take Hong Kong as uh, basically a, a very interesting, very modern, very new city. But I guess this inter-Asian relationship is related to tourism, to consumption to capitalism, uh, very much like, say, for example, for a contemporary gay living in Asia, probably Bangkok or Taipei will be such a destination. So my question was, in how do you theorize or how do you see this kind of inter-Asian relationship based on uh, tourism, based on very short-term um, visit? Uh, my second question is related to, uh, I think you, you must read uh, the, the Professor Travis Kong's uh, oral history for the older gay men in Hong Kong, Nan Nan Zheng Jun. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, when you uh, compare this older gay men in Hong Kong and uh, the older lesbian in the Asian communities, do you see any interesting differences or uh, similarities? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Song. Sure. Um, let me answer both questions. Um, so actually, um, the question around tourism, I think in the stories uh, that I presented briefly here today, um, different from the contemporary, let's say the contemporary gay or the contemporary, I should say the contemporary middle class gay or the contemporary middle class um, queer person, um, the, uh, uh, the, the informants, you know, who I spoke to, they actually had to travel for work. So it wasn't because of tourism that they had to, that uh, they had a chance to go, you know, for, for example, for Jin Mama, it wasn't um, a choice, you know, for, for her to go from Taiwan to Japan uh, to work. It was a necessity at that time to do that in order to um, hopefully to send some money back uh, to, um, Taiwan to her family, although she had a really hard time, actually, a lot of times her money was cheated uh, during her time working uh, in Japan. For Joey, who's the Singaporean uh, informant who went to Hong Kong and uh, Japan for work as mostly as a social hostess or as a bartender in nightclubs or a mama-san uh, in, in nightclubs and all of that, for her, it also was a necessity. I think part of it is um, if they were presented with um, opportunities to work abroad, of course, in a neighboring kind of Asian, uh, close enough Asian place. Um, and these opportunities for work that were taken up by these women is what makes me interested in really asking that question, um, following, you know, the Modern Girl Research Group um, charting um, how they move through Asia for work and why they chose particular kind of work because they would, that would be the kind of, um, that would kind of tell me what makes a Chinese woman lesbian, right? Why would you go for the, um, 
these are adventures, of course, to go abroad. It's by necessity that you need to go, but at the same time, you know there are lots of risks and adventures that come with certain kinds of occupations during the 50s and 60s and 70s under in these different places in Asia, under different kind of colonial administrations, under different, uh, all connected histories, right? So that's what makes me feel very fascinated in doing this research. I think it's what, like what I just talked to uh, Annika briefly before we started that I said the background of Annika's, you know, image is Bangkok. And Annika immediately said, Bangkok is a Chinese city, as a Chinese city, right? So that's kind of all that inter-Asia, you know, that we're talking about very much so, right? Around that, so. And your second question, actually, of course, uh, I've read uh, Travis uh, Lam Lam Jing Jun. Travis is actually my um, PhD supervisor, and I'm like the girl version of Travis. You know, that's what he always say. You know, <laughs> I don't know how to <laughs> go, but um, we talked about our projects together. Um, of course, uh, very good comparisons on the older gay men and the older um, lesbians and bisexual women uh, in Hong Kong. I've, they are very different, actually. I've come to the conclusion, of course, um, I, I found that a lot, of uh, a lot of women who I spoke to in Hong Kong, they were very independent. I think part of that in independence was, as women, it became more of a gender issue, right? As a woman to break out of that confusion Confucianist family, you know, um, um, traditions and all the patriarchal traditions that come with it. You've got to be quite tough. You know, got to be quite strong, independent, tough to be able to emerge. You know, during those years, you know, um, to be able to talk to me now about what your stories were during that time. So, not to say that the older gay men uh, they are not independent, but it's almost. It's because of gender, who is entitled to be in the public sphere during the early days, right? Who actually would have more leverage or more public spaces to go out into. For women, I think it's much harder that way because every little step of looking for your own job, um, for example, in Hong Kong, the story says um, for some of them to work in factories, that is actually the happy moments for the working class women. Uh, that I spoke to in Hong Kong. Working in factories along assembly lines were hard, but it was almost like a same-sex environment that they really were able to escape from their families. But at the same time, as working daughters, using the co-constables uh, term as working daughters, all the money they make goes to their brothers, you know, to, to support their brother's education and all that, right? So it's, it's a really a lot more about gender when I was doing this uh, research more than about just sexualities itself, if I had to really compare with the older gay men uh, project about it. And I'll give you, I'll share also one uh, anecdote, you know, because um, the older gay men always want to get together with the older uh, Chinese lesbians and bisexual women as a social group, you know, support group, social group. So I tried to ask some of my older Chinese lesbian and bisexual women whether they were willing to like, participate in the social group to hang out in a support group with these older gay men. Quite a number of them said to me, said, no, flat out, no. I had my whole life taking care of men in my family, my father, my brothers, you know, my uncles, you know, I have no desire at my age now to hang out with other men anymore. You know, so I had to relay this very sad message back to Travis, you know, saying that I'm so sorry I couldn't get us, you know, not everyone want to be with all your older gay men. Uh, and, that, and then, of course, Travis made this uh, funny joke with me. Mm, so exclusive, you these women, you know, all the time. <laughs> but that's the dynamic that really shows history, right? Shows gender dynamics and the kind of... Uh, um, probably the kind of sexism and all that that they experienced when they were growing up also, right? Thanks. I think we, that's all. Yeah, thanks. I think we should take some questions from the chat and I see two that we might be able to combine. So we have a question from Lulin He. What do you think is the biggest resistance or difficulty in your research is it class or social prejudice or something else? And I would like to try combining it with a question from Evan Austin. 
Uh, thank you so much for speaking tonight. Can you please speak to the bias in the informants that you were able to speak to and why that bias may have occurred? So yes, they're different questions, but maybe they group together well. Sure. Um, I think the most difficult challenge, right, in uh, for me, I think is asking the asking the informants to talk about experiences of discrimination. Yeah, that was the uh, I think that was the hardest part, and and the reason being it is um, they grew up in an era that was very of of course very very um, conservative, but they were able to carve out spaces to live their lives, right? To be able to have still have same-sex relationships and all that. So they went through a lot. So in their minds, when I was talking to them as a younger person talking to them, um, I felt it was almost difficult to, to get them to talk about the experiences of being discriminated, right? Because a lot of them would feel, would actually jump right into a space where they felt um, I wasn't discriminated against. I made it, right? I really made it. I wasn't discriminated against. And even if I was discriminated against, I survived, right? And I, I don't want to go back to talking about it. Or I had um, some informants were very, um, uh, were actually offended by this question, right? That you even ask, uh, how, how dare you ask me about this experience, right? I don't feel I was discriminated. I have no um, I have no, uh, I don't always agree with how young people now always go out on pride parades, right? What is it to be um, proud of? Why do you have to show everybody who you are, you know? Um, what is the point of doing that, um, of, of do, you know, uh, of being um, so out and open about it, you know? So there are quite a few of them who really actually strongly felt that way because in, of course, it, putting it all in context, I understand where they're coming from, right? So it's hard to tease out the story. Uh, for me, that was the hardest part. And it takes a long time to actually um, social, to socialize with them, um, to actually, uh, you have, in these kind of stories, you need to kind of spend a lot more social time with them than actually doing formal interviews, you know? So that's what I found myself in the end, having to do that quite a bit. So um, for the second uh, question is the bias towards, um, can, can you explain a, li a, bit, a little bit more about what you mean by the bias towards uh, in informants? Then I can answer it better uh, for that. Uh, hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for speaking today. Um, okay. And I was getting at a comment you made earlier about um, mm -hmm. almost the homogeneity in the different classes and different sites that you were speaking of. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit more to that um, with regards to class or any other identity politic and how, um, you know, there are certain types or groups of informants that you were able to speak with and weren't able to speak with and why that might be. Mm, 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 mm. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I think one, one thing that I, uh, maybe I can uh, be more, uh, other than the, uh, the class, although it's complicated because I, I do have, you know, uh, it's always hard to strike a balance of um, different uh, class from, uh, backgrounds, but you try to have that, of course, diversity of uh, class backgrounds. That's important in a sample in doing this kind of uh, research work. Um, what I think was interesting for me is because I'm moving, um, now that I've been doing my work with transgender men uh, in Hong Kong and Thailand, I reframe my questions again when I go back to asking some of the butch lesbians um, that whether, whether they would feel that they are actually trans men, if they have the language to say it, right? If they actually have the language and the means to actually uh, transition, or even just the language to say it, would that be um, something that we can explore? So I think that's what makes it um, interesting for me right now is to see how these two, part of these two projects can merge this way. But I have to do it with care. Because they come to this project, of course, first of identifying themselves as older lesbians and bisexual women. And now I'm asking them the other question about, you know, whether you would feel that you can categorize yourself in that. And labels themselves are very tricky, you know. I think labels themselves are also very contextualized, you know. So um, 
you can say LGBTQI plus uh, now, uh, I'm sure in um, the context of, let's say this lecture, uh, let's say that um, you've, uh, you have North American education and being able to say LGBTQI plus um, um, very easily that way. But it doesn't make many sense actually when I interview people in this project to tell to talk about these um, labels unless you unless for some of the women I've talked to very 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 few of them are themselves activists and already very well versed in these kind of language and in fighting for rights right other than that the usual the common you know a person I talked to would had no idea about these labels and would not really translate at all to their lives, you know, uh, there's a meaning for that, from that, yeah. Thank you, I think Xin Le has had a hand up for a long time. Hi, Professor Denise, thank you for such interesting talk. And uh, I'm really interested uh, uh, in the question you brought up about the intersection between like sexual culture of older, lesbians and the ethnic identity because um, I noticed I, I had lived and studied in Hong Kong for two years and the travel to Taiwan had friends have friends in both places I have noticed like um, among like young people they 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 don't like use like or refer themselves ref, like refer themselves as like, uh, Chinese, they would rather use Hong Kong needs, Taiwan needs. And uh, I also noticed it's also kind of an uh, intergenerational thing, like, and also very kind of intellectual thing in, in especially in Hong Kong context, like uh, those, uh, what I noticed like for Hong Kong, like older generations, they may not care much, like the difference between Hong Kong needs and the Chinese. But for younger generations, they care. And also, I think this kind of brings to the juxtaposition with the, in, the difference uh, of intergenerational sexual culture, like those younger and the older lesbians. Uh, in general, like as you mentioned, like for older lesbians, they, are, they, they consider the waiting and the absence of companionship is another form of intimacy. But like um, for younger generation, like they they are more open and they're using uh, using dating apps and uh, so I wonder like how whether you notice that that kind of tension differences and how do you understand? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. You know, Sunday, you're right. That definitely generational uh, gaps even uh, between myself and talking with um, the older uh, Chinese uh, lesbian and bisexual women. Although I don't feel the gap is that, um, that uh, huge between myself and, and them. Um, but I think um, Chineseness, of course, is, uh, is a very complex uh, concept and it has increasingly becomes heightened, um, especially I think with what's going on, you know, um, in Hong Kong and in Taiwan in relation to, of course, uh, mainland China and the rest of the world, I think that would place what we mean by Chineseness very differently. And I think that really explains why a younger generation, um, and I don't think it um, applies to just the younger generation, at least not in Hong Kong, I feel, um, that there are certain, um, that we want to distinguish the Chineseness so um, differently, right? For someone like myself, if, who has worked in uh, Taiwan for four years, of course, that's when you realize your Chineseness is so much different, you know, as a Hong Kong Chinese uh, person, also as a Hong Kong Chinese person who worked in, uh, 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 who lived for a long time in Vancouver, in Canada, all these come into play around that, right? So that's what makes it interesting for this project too, because in terms of how they express the Chineseness in this project is very different from how I think we express our Chineseness now here in this present moment. And that's what I have to do for my book project to really untangle what that really means across these three places. And I don't mean to say that, they're, I only mean to say that they're predominantly Chinese societies because of course in, um, in Taiwan and in Singapore, there are also other ethnic um, 
communities and ethnic populations there, which I didn't interview them as uh, part of my project, but they're always intersecting with the lives of people who are there, right? So they're part of the fabric of that society for sure, right? So I can only say it's predominantly kind of Chinese uh, societies uh, for that matter. And intergenerational, of course, is, is uh, an, another point of this. The, that's why during the interview when I had with Jin Mama, she actually really berated us on how we feel um, relationships are so short-lived and how can we just rely on apps and dating apps to prove that you have a relationship. Where for her, one letter, writing one letter and receiving a letter that you wait for weeks to get that is actually the confirmation of a certain form of relationship. And that kind of waiting, you know, longing and waiting every few weeks to get a letter, sometimes every year you get a letter, that kind of relationship for her lingered on all the way from her 20s to her 80s, which was the most amazing thing for me in my um, interview with her, right, where she actually said that, look, young people, you had no idea what love is and romance is, <laughs> and you can't deal with this kind of longing and waiting, you know, because you don't really, you your vision is so um, so short lived in this way, you know, and that ties in a little bit with when I asked most of them whether they would get married if same sex marriage is available now, you know, almost actually almost very I would say just two percent or three percent, you know, would, of them would say they would get married if uh, now that same sex marriage is available, you know, in in parts of whether for example in Taiwan. Right. Or or I would ask in Hong Kong if it's if it's available, would you consider it? Most of them, if they consider it, it's always just practical reasons of immigration, for example. Right. Other than that, nobody would think that it's a good idea, actually. They would actually think, why? Why bother? It's not a good institution. You know, it hasn't worked well for me when I was married to a guy. I wouldn't even want to imagine going through that institution again. Yeah. Hope I answered your question. Our next question comes from Nate, please. Hello, Dr. Chang. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Excellent. Thank you for your talk. I found it supremely interesting. And I have a question uh, regarding one of your previous responses uh, in which you referred to the necessary sort of emergent attitudes taken by these uh, women in the 70s and 80s in order to push back against the oppressive natures of their modernities in those times. Now, in your article, I was sort of struck by the opposite in which I think her name was Betty, a woman that you interviewed sort of had the opposite. Um, she had performative kindness in order to maybe fly under the radar and, you know, not mm -hmm. attract as much attention. So I'm, I'm curious as to why you think um, some people take that strategy of this kindness route? Do you think that's more common? Is there something specific about uh, the regional cultural contexts and maybe differences between the three different geographies in which you uh, mm -hmm. interviewed people um, in mm -hmm. regards to kindness? Mm -hmm. um, of Yes, I think so. I think it's it's hard to, of course, in doing this kind of research, it's hard to generalize uh, across um, the sites as, as well as across different uh, people because of the way we um, do this kind of um, research, um, basically with such a small of course, sample from each site uh, for that. I think people do take different strategies, you know, in terms of coming, uh, becoming a uh, lesbian and, and being kind and being flying under the radar is probably what I see as a survival kind of mechanism and a coping strategy throughout um, their lives as living um, to be able to be the person you are and also to be able to live that long enough um, to be able to speak to me about the story, right? So I think that's one of the common kind of strategies to see actually um, of living um, under the radar, actually. Yeah. That's more common actually than the other ones that I, I pointed out that are much more uh, brazen in their adventures, 
Yeah, actually. I just didn't use a lot of these kind of um, flying under the radar kind of stories that uh, in this presentation, let's put it this way. Yeah. This links up really well with a question about research methodology in the chat. It's from Marisa and she writes, um, Hi, Dr. Tang, thanks so much for your talk. How did you determine who to interview? In other words, what constituted, in quotes, a lesbian or bisexual woman based on your definitions or those developed out of the participants? I'm struggling to determine this in my own dissertation on urban planning for older lesbians in LA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I didn't talk a lot about methodology in my presentation, but um, I, uh, when I first start to recruit participants, of course, it's through uh, gatekeepers, you know, and through their circles first. You know, uh, some of the older lesbians I know, um, the key person then kind of like uh, expanded out through their social circles, right, um, to do them. So the different gatekeepers in different um, uh, communities and in, across different uh, research sites. So how I define them, how I would say that they can be um, uh, part of this uh, research project. First of all, now there's so few, you know, that who are willing to talk about their stories, you know, who are already reaching that age 60 plus and above, you know, you basically talk to everyone first before you determine whether they can, that you're going to um, be able to um, um, collect more data from them. So I cast a very wide net first, I would say, uh, because with um, older uh, women, I, I feel you need to kind of uh, cast a wider net and talk first uh, because they come through gatekeepers already. So there's already a sense that they are known to have same-sex relationships at some point in their lives, even though they might identify, they might have bisexual at, in practice, they might be bisexual, right? But if they come to the research already knowing that you're doing a research on um, older women with same-sex desires, that means they already have something to contribute. Right. So I would already, uh, of course, be very welcoming in that sense um, to talk about it, uh, to hear the stories about it. Right. So I don't, of course, I wouldn't have the criteria of how long your relationship has to be, you know, in order to qualify uh, to become uh, an informant in this sense. Right. But most of the women I talked to had really significant and have been able to really talk about their re romantic relationships. Um, uh, with same-sex partners significantly, right? Um, with or without sexual interaction uh, relations, though, you have to remember uh, part of that because it doesn't mean you, some of them being very platonic for an extremely long time, but were able to really talk about that uh, relationship uh, in depth, how, what that meant to them, you know? So I also count that in because I, I don't want, I, I don't feel, I think, um, also, sex itself, physically, sex itself is differently experienced for a lot of women, right? Across um, histories, across ages and classes and all that. It means differently. Yeah, sometimes with cost, right? The next person uh, would be Jackie Tron Newton, if Jackie is still here. <laughs> Jackie might have became a different disguise already <laughs> i mean okay yeah that, okay then if jackie is not currently available i'm sorry but the, the question was answered so i'm gonna ask okay thank you <laughs> hi huang <laughs> okay um in okay i think we were basically out of time right yes we're basically out of time. No, you can go on until yeah. nine o'clock. Oh, we can? Okay, great. Um, so we will uh, move on to the next person with a question who had her hand up for a long time. It is McKinley. McKinley, would you still like to ask your question? Give you a... S um, yes? Sure. That would be um, so great. I, I typed it in the chat, so I'll just read what I wrote, I guess. Um, yeah. So first, thank you so much for giving the lecture. It was very informative. Um, so I was thinking about the moment um, in Mama Jin's story where she mentions like letter writing and 
sorry <laughs> and um when she said mm-hmm. she has like a girlfriend in every place as well as like how mobilities played into several of the narratives that uh, you discussed so this made me consider how despite like spatial distance that relationships could still be intimate and one could possibly argue like even more real than identities that are adopted when this part of oneself is hidden uh, so when so my question is um when there is a uh, sorry, when there is a form of like social unacceptance toward an identity that's instilled into a place, do you think that alignment with this identity encourages a sense of displacement or like a preference um, for connections that are not grounded in place? Great question. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's um, hmm, but it's not grounded in place. I think. Hmm. I think let's put it this way. I think when when maybe there is um, a lack of social recognition of um, certain kind of love relationships, then we tend to look for love in many different forms and many different ways. And with the Jin Mama story. I feel then that every little, we can put it more um, literally or poetically, maybe every look that um, Jin Mama's been able to um, connect to, or every just every moment maybe that Jin Mama feels that there might be a slight interest of her, that she would count that as already maybe a fleeting moment of um, love that she can express. Uh, in her same-sex desires, if I think of it this way. Because a lot of them um, describe the way they connect with others in these kind of uh, disconnection, if, uh, how you frame it, is actually um, interesting in the way they would always boast about the number of lovers they have. It's almost, um, and I would say boasting because I would always go back to them and we would laugh together, saying, how can you have hundreds of girlfriends? You know, How can that possibly be? Or so many at the same time. And they would laugh, of course, you know, not only Jin Mama, but Joey and, and others, but they would laugh you know, and, it's, and say that, of course, you know, in, in moments where you always feel your love is already neglected and um, un, uh, unforbidden, you know, um, you would think of every potential person as a potential opportunity for that, right? So why not just keep them all these memories alive and and weave them all into these stories about it, you know? Which I feel it's, um, uh, of course, maybe it's being very romantic about it, you know, even uh, for me as an interviewer, uh, watching them or, or hearing how they talk about the past lives. It's almost very, the way they talk about the love and romance, I always tell my friends that too, and my colleagues, that it always feels more, more liberatory than the present, you know, because they don't, in, in, some, in some ways, you know, because the whole outside environment, it's so stifling. You know, the whole thing, it's so um, forbidden that you don't see that. You don't see that kind of rights-based argument. You don't see that kind of um, pressure. I think for some young people now, I feel that they have some, for some young people, if you're, if, of course, if you live in a place where you can get married with your same-sex partner, right? For some young people, the, now the, the, the dilemma is, you know, should I get married or when do I have to get married or do I always to be, have to be in a monogamous coupled relationship? How do I deal with other things, right? For them, none of this actually <laughs> enters the picture because it was never available. It was always about heterosexual marriages, you know, and having children and even with that kind of heterosexual marriage is mean having children, right? And, and making livelihoods and all that. So it's a very different framework of that. Yeah, that I find fascinating, yeah. Thank you for that answer. Yeah, thanks, McKinley. Thank you so much, Professor Tang, for this wonderful presentation and really wonderful conversation afterwards. Um, The talk is being recorded, so people who have written questions in the chat, Professor Tang will still get to read them. Um, If she hasn't yet, there's a a couple of people we unfortunately couldn't get to. Um, 
I was also asked to briefly remind people of the next lex lecture. It's on March 14th at 4.45 in the afternoon. It's by Lawrence Chua, who will speak on provincializing China, race and architecture in colonial era Binan. Okay, um, please join me however you can in thanking Professor Tang for this wonderful evening together. Thank you so much, Denise. Thank you, Annika. Thank you all for being here. And feel free to email me if you have the questions. Yeah. What's your email? We'll put it in the chat. Great, great. I know we didn't get to get to some of the people here. I saw the hands. Sorry before. about that. Yeah. Like Howard and also someone else. Yeah. All right. Stay tuned, everybody. Thank you very much. I'm going to end it now. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.